Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach um, from Ambassador Xing's uh, presentation and focus on some of the similar issues, but from a different angle. So my talk is, is divided into three parts. The first one is China's threat perception in Africa. What security problems does China see in Africa? Second section um, on why these security issues matter to China and how do they damage China's interest, which will facilitate the next topic, which is uh, how China is going about to address these issues. And that includes the approach on the, on the multilateral level, on the UN level, on the uh, regional level, on the bilateral level, and last but not um, least, um, almost a unilateral level that we are seeing more out of uh, more and more from the Chinese presence in the uh, in the African continent. So, what are the threat perception that China has in uh, in Africa? What are the primary security threats that China sees? China identifies four categories of traditional security threats in Africa. The first one is a political transition crisis and associated, for example, military uh, military coups. And this has happened quite frequently, um, actually, to China's discomfort in the past few years. And most recently, we remember Zimbabwe, we remember Sudan. And the second category is uh, domestic crisis in, uh, within African countries, such as uh, tribal conflicts, religious violence or religious conflicts, factional politics, civil war, like Libya. The third category is uh, terrorism. So we have seen Boko Haram, uh, Al-Shabaab, ISIS expansion in, in Africa. And the last category is, uh, is more traditional in China's policy lexicon, which is uh, local security threat or the safety threats to, um, to, to Chinese nationals and Chinese assets on the ground. And the Chinese do see that this uh, increasing local security and safety threats is partially at least um, associated with the with the uh, deterioration of the economic conditions in Africa. So the African governments have less ability and less material and uh, less resources to spend on providing local safeguards. So why do these security threats matter to China? How do they undercut China's national interest? I would say just like Ambassador Xing pointed out, 10 years ago, the Chinese primary security concern in Africa is associated with its nationals. With Chinese population on the ground, Chinese companies, Chinese workers being kidnapped, or Chinese businessmen being uh, being harassed or being being robbed in Africa. So 10 years ago, it was very much on the local level, focused on Chinese nationals. But now, as China's engagement expands in, in Africa, the security problem in Africa has a much deeper and broader impact over what China is trying to pursue in Africa. So, for example, in, in terms of the political impact, um, how Africa's security issues affect China's political interest, is this a, an area that people normally do not talk too much about, which is related to China's non-interference principle. That China finds itself increasingly at odds with African countries or African Union on the issue of interference. So in the past, both Africa and China, at least from the Chinese perspective, used to insist on the non-interference principle. And this is how also China sees itself as a moral superiority in its engagement in Africa's security issues. But what the Chinese foreign policy community has identified is that in the past 20 years, it is African countries that have increasingly raised the de demand for collective security and for interference in specific um, security crisis in Africa. So like, for example, for the African Union from, very, uh, from its very beginning, the charter has given the African Union the right to, to interfere. And China also noted, noted that African Union in its history has had several, well, many records of, uh, of sanction and also uh, military interference, uh, inter intervention. So because China sticks to the non-interference principle, which means that China will maintain relations with the sovereign government in a country in crisis, even with uh, domestic, for example, domestic civil war, China will maintain the relationship both politically and economically with, uh, the, with the African governments. So that means that China cannot timely or cannot really uh, naturally respond to African Union's demand for, um, for intervention.
And it also means that when it comes to the UN resolution or it comes to the U uh, voting as a uh, UN Security Council, China usually takes a very cautious attitude and drags its feet when there is inter military intervention involved. <laughs> So this type of principle that China has adhered to has created more and more disagreements between China and Africa from the Chinese perspective. And also the security problems or the security challenges in Africa has also resulted in disagreements within the African countries themselves. And that put China at a very difficult place. So we realized, for example, in the past few years, the, um, the domestic crisis within one African country not only has its spillover effect, it also draws in t the attention from not only countries within the sub-region, but in some cases from the whole region. So the expansion of the participation in terms of the, the solution to the security problem has, um, has involved the mediation or the intervention from countries almost across the, uh, the, the continent. So what, for China, what that means is that when all these countries participate in the, in the peace process or participate in the conflict mediation, it fully exposes the internal disagreements among African countries. And it makes it even more difficult for an external player like China to pick its position. Um, so one example that the Chinese always refers to is, uh, is, uh, is the issue of South Sudan, that when there are disagreements within the African Union as for what, what should be done, then that put China in an extremely difficult position as for which side to choose. So this non-interference principle that China adheres to has emerged as uh, the security challenges in Africa um, increases. This non-interference principle has become a sore spot between China and some African countries and between China and African Union. And this is one issue that people don't really pay too much attention to. So economically, of course, security crisis within Africa has hindered the deeper or broader economic cooperation between China and African countries in several different ways. The first way is that it, it hinders the industrial capacity cooperation, which is a key word of China's Belt and Road Initiative endeavor in, in, in Africa. So China's original um, intention, or its original blueprint, is that through Belt and Road Initiative, China will be able to shift some of its traditional manufacturing industries or its infrastructure and heavy industries to, to Africa. But what has happened is that as the security crisis in Africa escalates, China realized that industrial capacity, um, capacity cooperation is capital intensive. And it also involves a much longer repayment terms. Yearly, it will require the destination of the investment to be politically and in terms of security to be stable for at least 10 years. So coming to the African countries with relatively higher level of security risks, so there are very few countries in China's policy lexicon that actually meet the Chinese criteria for local security. Um, and the, the demonstration or the exemplary cases that China has had in terms of uh, the industrial capacity cooperation is limited to Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. And although Ethiopia now becomes a curious question for the Chinese as well. Um, the second category of the security, of the impact of security issues on China's economic plan is that the security crisis or the security problems in Africa has prevented what the Chinese would like to see as a deeper regional integration of the uh, Chinese economic effort in, in Africa. So the security challenges has led to uh, a, a situation where different countries or different blocs are segregated from each other. And the conflicts has prevented the formation of a more networked economic development strategy and e uh, economic development um, platform. So for example, in the case of Ethiopia and, um, and, and Kenya, the Chinese realized that, that the region close to the border of, with Somalia is very difficult to be integrated into the whole economic plan. Then although we, we do see that the economic cooperation between China and Africa has been growing exponentially in the past 10, uh, 10 20 years, but the economic cooperation model that China has had in Africa is very much country-based. So it's bilateral. Although China wants to push for a regional-based network and regional-based economic growth approach, 
And also the other uh, characteristics of the economic cooperation is that the Chinese economic activities on the ground is very much associated with natural resources in terms of the uh, import from Africa and also contract services where the Chinese companies go to Africa to build the infrastructure projects. That's actually categorized as, uh, as China's export to, to Africa. So which means that without solving the security uh, issues in individual um, Africa subregion or individual African countries, it is very difficult to change the fact that each country market is small and they're all separated. So they cannot achieve the goal of a, a whole industrial chain, and they cannot achieve the goal of marketing integration, which is where China's current Belt and Road Initiative already arrived at. And last but not least, in terms of the economic impact of uh, security challenges on China's economic interest, of course, is uh, a stable supply of raw materials from, uh, from Africa. So like Ambassador Xing, Xing mentioned, 85% of China's import from Africa is pretty much focused on raw materials. But when we look at the, the top 10 countries where China imports its uh, raw material, is Angola, is the DRC, is Libya, is Ghana, is, uh, is countries that do not necessarily have the best security uh, situation in, um, in its domestic. So the political situation in these countries have had a significant impact over the um, supply of raw materials to Chinese companies and to Chinese importers. So that is to say that the security um, issues in Africa has a major impact over China's confidence looking to the future, over the long-term confidence that China has in terms of the investment in Africa and trade with Africa. So this means that um, according to the Chinese customs data, the largest category of uh, China's Af uh, economic cooperation with Africa, like I mentioned, is the service contracts. It's the Chinese contract companies going to Africa to build infrastructure projects. And the biggest pro challenge for that category of trade is, uh, is the political instability. So the frequent political regime um, transition and the military conflicts in Africa has made the Chinese companies face the consequences of, um, for example, the revoke of the contracts that Chinese companies signed with the previous government and now not being acknowledged by the new government. With, um, they also face the danger of uh, violations of the payment terms that the new government says that we do not agree to the terms that you, you reached with, uh, with the previous government, uh, the delay in terms of payment, and also the um, confiscation of Chinese assets on, on the ground. So in countries such as Libya and South Sudan, Chinese companies have had multiple cases of that they have to complete all their projects and to withdraw all the, all the workers and all the Chinese nationals, which means that they cannot really reclaim the, uh, the revenue or the investment that they have already made on, on the ground. One common argument that we do hear is that, well, these companies should have had insurance, right? when they invest in a politically unstable country, they have insurance, and the insurance should pay them off uh, for, their, for their losses. But in reality, for all the economic losses, Chinese companies suffer because of the domestic, um, domestic security crisis. At the most, what they can get is a compensation for the direct economic loss, which means that the damage to their, um, to their assets on the ground. Mm -hmm. So for the indirect economic loss that has created in their operations and in their business activities on the ground, they do not get any compensation. So for a lot of Chinese companies, they start to wonder that as the security situation in some African countries continue to deteriorate, is this still worth their while to, to go to Africa? So um, what are the Chinese reactions now faced with all these uh, challenges and factors undermining China's interest? China's reaction is divided into several layers. So there's multilateral on the international, on the UN level, and multilateral on the regional level. And there's bilateral level cooperation, um, or bilateral level approach, and then there's unilateral level approach. So on the UN level, of course, China is, uh, like Ambassador Xing already pointed out, is one of the most active participants in the UN peacekeeping missions. And that is because China, as a member of the um, permanent member of the uh, UN Security Council, China sees that UN peacekeeping missions as the most just and the most authoritative coming to, interna uh, coming to international intervention. And China also sees UN peacekeeping as a primary platform for uh, China's involvement in the, um, 
at least on the international level, um, in Africa peace and security issues. But currently, um, the Chinese identify the three issues or the three challenges that they need to address coming to their UN peacekeeping involvement. The first one is that they realize that, that they cannot just send peacekeepers because peacekeepers do not get to make the decision. So for the Chinese, one of the uh, pressing issues that, um, that we have seen proposal inside the Chinese government is that they actually need to send more civilians to the UN peacekeeping mission who are in charge of the operation of the, uh, of the peacekeeping uh, missions. They are also the practitioner who are developing and who are um, expanding the outscope of, uh, of UN theory or the UN practice on, on intervention. Um, and when it is allowed, if, um, the technical and the logistical conditions allow, China will aim to send more combat troops to, to Africa. But that depends on a, a, a few internal factors as well. And the last challenge that China sees in terms of its UN peacekeeping involvement is to enhance the professional quality or the professional qualification of Chinese peacekeepers, because the Chinese peacekeepers do still have this reputation of uh, staying in their own little block and do not really mingle with the rest of the, with the, rest of the crew. So that's on the UN multilateral level. Then in terms of the regional level, China makes it a priority to support the independent peacekeeping by Africa itself, or by African Union and by African countries themselves. So they do see that uh, African Union currently faces a deficiency in terms of its capacity coming to peacekeeping. It also faces a challenge of the lack of resources. So China is aiming to, for example, provide more concrete support to uh, African Union's peacekeeping mission. For example, including uh, providing the training in terms of military staff, police, and also the uh, civilian officials. They help to build um, the barracks and build the logistical centers and build some of the infrastructure related to the African Union's peacekeeping mission. They are making contribution both in terms of technology and in terms of financial resources to the, um, to the standby force in Africa. And last but not least, they are also trying to enhance its assistance or its funding to international or regional organizations and non-government organizations in Africa that participate in the African peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping activities. So that's on the regional, the AU level. Then on the bilateral level, China-Africa bilateral uh, military cooperation. But this is also a myth for people who work on Africa in, in China. Because coming to the security threats that, for example, Chinese companies or the Chinese staff or the Chinese nationals face on the ground in African countries, the first reaction from the foreign ministry and the first reaction from um, a lot of experts who work on Africa is that, well, we have good relationship with governments in Africa. So we should ask the local governments to provide the assistance and to provide the security uh, protection to our people and to our assets. And that's where a lot of this bilateral military cooperation also um, has this country's origin too. But in reality, this rare, almost rarely happens. And there are many reasons associated with that and we can discuss in the Q&A. Um, but for the bilateral military cooperation, China provides arms sales to Africa. China also donates military equipment. China provides quite a large number of uh, training opportunities to African military personnel in defense, National Defense University in Beijing. But it's also, uh, just as an anecdote, the National Defense University in Beijing has two campuses. It has its main campus. It has also has this, um, uh, what they call the international international um, um, military training office, um, campus. And they are so far away from each other <laughs> that the international uh, students or the trainees are brought basically 20 miles away from the main campus. So it's very separated. Um, so they, they provide a large number of military training for African military personnel. They also provide fellowship programs and education opportunities for the uh, African uh, military. So that's on the bilateral level. And last but not least, there's this unilateral level approach, um, China's approach to Africa security threats, which is the effort to legitimize Chinese private security companies in Africa. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, I would say that it originated with the beginning of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the, the logic is that 
as more and more Chinese nationals are operating in Africa, and more and more Chinese companies are operating in Africa, and in those cases where the African governments cannot provide security and protection, and in those cases uh, the Chinese embassy has no capacity to provide the consular protection, then what is the best way out? And the Chinese also watched a lot of Hollywood movies, and they realized that, well, Black Water seems to be a pretty good model. So what they have done um, is uh, what I call the combination or the integration of uh, foreign security, uh, private security companies, and the domestic calling for the creation of Chinese private security companies to, prov to protect Chinese assets and protect Chinese uh, nationals, in, in, in this case, in Africa. They have operations in Southeast Asia, they have some operations in Central Asia. Uh, and one example, the Foreign uh, Frontier Services Group, is a joint venture between uh, Eric Prince and the Chinese state-owned company CITIC, C-I-T-I-C. And the headquarters of that company is based in Hong Kong, and it also has a field office in, in Nairobi. Um, and the primary goal of that company is to provide protection to Chinese nationals in, uh, in, in unstable countries. So, of course, they face a lot of legal constraints. Um, in several countries that we see that in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in Kenya, in Ghana, they all, we have all seen examples of this type of private Chinese security companies operating on the, on the ground. The problem is that they don't have work visa, they have tourist visa, and they also do not have the permission from the local governments to bear arms. And in all these cases, he, they, they all bear arms. And they also conduct what is regarded as illegal military training on the, on the ground. And in, uh, in Zimbabwe, the, um, just as an example, because Zimbabwe does not allow foreigners to uh, independently set up security companies, the Chinese company, um, or the, the Chinese security, private security company formed a collaborative relationship with what they call Chinese Community Neighborhood Watch. So, um, and at the beginning of this, uh, this, this joint venture or this, uh, this relationship, they also um, participate, joined the Zimbabwe uh, so police civilian cooperation organization. But because of the legal constraint, they cannot, uh, they cannot perform armed the patrol of the neighborhood, and they cannot use uh, firearms. Um, but the problem is that they do. And in uh, 2018, um, in the February, two of such Chinese security, private security guards uh, shot two locals, and one turned out to be the son of a former uh, member of parliament of, the, uh, of, the, of, of Zimbabwe. So, and later in 2018, these two Chinese nationals, they were sentenced to 42 months in, in prison. So this is a, a almost like a, a, a different angle when China looks at how to tackle the security threats on the ground in, in Africa. So it is quite a diverse approach. There are high, um, high profile or high politics approach at the UN level, but there are also low politics or local grassroots level cooperate, uh, approach such as uh, private security companies. So it's quite an interesting, um, interesting diversification. I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.